Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The announcement of recent coal plants closings in Indiana could be an indicator of the future of the industry. Really what's happening is uh, the economics uh, of the whole power business have changed so much that generating power by coal is just not the cheapest way to go. We find out how a 19th century feud resulted in one small Indiana town's exotic name. And state lawmakers are looking at a bill that tax down rules for services that homeless people receive. And when you're homeless, you don't have a residence. so. So trying to prove something you don't have becomes impossible. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, Hoosier Energy's announcement that it will retire its Merrim generating station in 2023 is another closure in a long line of coal plant retirements in Indiana. With other utilities pledging to quit coal in the near future, reporter Mitch Legan discusses the state's slow shift to sustainable energy. Indiana has a long history of coal consumption, and so does Doug Childs. My father, uh, my grandfather rather, was a coal miner, and I literally worked in a coal plant in Ohio. So you know, they're near and dear to my heart. Now CEO of the Utilities District of Western Indiana Rural Electric Co-op, Childs, much like the state itself, is at a bit of a crossroads. After almost 25 years of working with municipal utilities, Childs is now faced with an energy future that'll rely less on coal than it ever has. Really what's happening is uh, the economics uh, of the whole power business have changed so much that generating power by coal is just not the cheapest way to go uh, by a long shot. So really it's just sheer economics have really caught up with Merrim and really uh, it's catching up or has caught up with virtually every coal plant in the country. But recent developments in the coal industry have changed the outlook on coal. Tougher federal environmental regulations, market forces and advancing technology have made coal more expensive than other forms of energy. Now what's happening, the market is, is responding to the economic signals they have. And really coal is, um, you know, regardless of what happens, coal is just too expensive right now uh, to, uh, uh, to be a, a really a, a viable uh, generating source anymore. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, Indiana is the second largest coal consumer in the country, behind Texas. In 2018, coal generated 70 percent of the state's electricity. Indiana has enough coal, um, according to the Geological and Water Survey, to uh, power us for another 500 years using today's technology. Improvements in sustainable energy are making it more reliable and natural gas is the cheapest it's ever been. Things are changing everywhere. A lot will depend on what happens next November. When I came in the legislature, natural gas sold for $14 a therm. Last week it sold for under two. But old habits die hard. The state is drafting a long-term energy plan. Many in the coal industry are concerned with the reliability of other energy sources, which is why Representative Ed Soliday is pushing for a bill that would make it harder for utilities to close a coal plant. Whether that's coal or rabbits on a treadmill, we need the lights to come on when we flip the switch. We're in transition. Not the first time, won't be the last, but we're in transition and all we're asking is to be able to manage it. Among other things, the state would have to review possible coal plant closures beginning now through 2021 and determine whether the closure is what they consider, quote, reasonable. Uh, and as a result, they're going to be able to power your factories uh, more reliably and less expensively, generally speaking, right now than alternative uh, energy sources. And I think that's one of the ripple effects that people, you know, they need to, to think about in terms of making too rapid a transition from where we are now to the, to the future. 
Environmental groups and even the NAACP have spoken out against the bill, saying it props up the coal industry and would disproportionately harm communities of color. But those in the coal industry say keeping coal plants around protects Indiana's energy supply and helps ratepayers. The energy module of the future, it may not be wind and solar, it may be something entirely different, but we don't want to put forth um, policy or make decisions that's going to drive the cost of electricity up substantially during that interim period before that's available. Child says that won't be the case. He says consumers won't see their rates increase, which would most definitely happen if the utility continued to rely on Marum and its coal-fired units. He says it's possible customers could even see small savings starting around 2023. Last year, um, Marum only ran at about a 58 percent capacity factor, and there were three months that Marum didn't run at all. The light stayed on. Um, there is certainly reliability is always a concern, but we can run a reliable grid without uh, Marum, certainly. He says advancing without coal is going to take some planning, but the Marum site will most likely be reused. There's a tremendous amount of transmission capacity available there, which you, would, you could imagine. Um, I could definitely see a possibility of developing solar, um, a large uh, uh, solar field on that site. So, you know, the site of Marum is very valuable and will definitely be reused. And Mitch Legan joins us now for a little bit more. Mitch, you know, as Indiana's future of energy changes, Right now, how many coal-fired plants are there in the state? Right, so this is, as of November 2019, that's the most up-to-date information I could get, and that's from the Energy Information Administration, you know, as I was talking about. Uh, there are 16 coal-fired power plants in the state, and the top eight really kind of carry the state with that electricity generation. They are the big heavy hitters, more or less, and they provided about 55 million megawatts of electricity in 2018, and again, those bottom eight are more for intermittent use. So can you put this into perspective for us, how many different energy sources are there in the state? Right, and so as I said in the package, you know, the 70% of Indiana's energy or electricity was generated by coal in 2018. Uh, that same year, wind powered 5% of electricity, where biomass, solar, and hydroelectric, they combined for just over 1% of the utility scale generation. So, you know, there's a ways to go with that sustainable future. And really quickly, we talked about the bill and that story. What's the latest with that? Yep, and so I talked with Becky Thiel, our environmental reporter, and she says, you know, all there is to do is wait right now. It's heading to the Senate for consideration. All right, Mitch, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Now for headlines, we go to this week's top stories. Lawmakers are considering restrictions on how often schools in need of additional funding can propose referenda measures to local taxpayers. Now, right now, schools can propose referenda twice a year and in school-funded special elections. But lawmakers added a proposal into a bill this week that would limit those to general elections about once every two years. Standalone bills to add referendum restrictions died this year and last year after failing to get enough support. Lawmakers are scheduled to vote on it in the coming days. Over a two-year period, Indiana paid at least $1 million for medical coverage for Hoosiers who had already died. And that's according to an audit by the Department of Health and Human Services. The audit found Indiana Medicaid failed to record death notifications in 2016 and 2017, which led to an estimated $1.1 million in payments to managed care organizations on behalf of dead Hoosiers. The audit also found that even when the state was aware of some deaths, the payments still weren't recovered. The city of Bloomington is rolling out a plan to provide needle disposal boxes in public parks. Benta Boutier reports that the Parks and Recreation Department recently installed a sharp box at Butler Park in the near West Side neighborhood. The Parks Department plans to install two more sharps boxes, one at Seminary Square and one at the Building Trades Park. Paula McDevitt, the administrator at the Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department, says that for the last two years her department has taken data on the number of needles found in parks. In 2018, they found 490 discarded needles. In 2019, that number rose to 816. The sharps boxes are being put at the three locations where the most needles are found. When it escalated to the numbers that we were seeing, um, we knew that we needed to do something about it. She says she hopes that installing the boxes will improve public safety for park users, preventing them from stepping on discarded needles. As the community conversation has come more around and accepting and the education is, you know, is there's more information out there, it's become more palatable for us to get involved and, and to be part of the solution. 
The boxes are being installed in partnership with the Monroe County Health Department. They'll be providing the Sharps boxes for the Parks Department to use. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. Indiana's governor has told state agencies to calculate the damage along the, Lake uh, uh, along the Lake Michigan shoreline that's been caused by high water. The Indiana Department of Homeland Security has declined to declare a state emergency, but Governor Eric Holcomb said he wanted a new review. The erosion is happening as Lake Michigan approaches its highest levels in recorded history. Legislation to ban handheld cell phone use while driving appears headed to passage after a Senate committee easily approved the measure. That's even as some lawmakers seem to lower expectations Tuesday about the bill's potential effectiveness. Indiana Prosecuting Attorney's Counsel's Chris Daniels likens the bill to speed limits. They don't stop everyone from speeding, but they do change driving habits. The bill passed the committee 8 to 1. Under Mayor John Hamilton, the city of Bloomington is facing multiple laws and dealing with ongoing controversies around the city-run farmer's market and an attempt to use eminent domain to take a building from a local business. We sat down with Hamilton the week of his State of the City address to talk about two stories that kept the city in the headlines over the past year. So we just received word yesterday, a press release from your office that the city is going to is going to redesign the four street parking garage uh, without the Juan Sells Realty building, even though this, this is still tied up in the appeals process. Yeah. So what's the reasoning behind that? Well, you know, we, we had litigation about the eminent domain suit. We were disappointed very late last year. Uh, we had a trial court here that, that ruled uh, the public garage was not a public use, which we're disappointed in. But even at that time, we said we, we really need to pursue the two options of either we're going to get the property, uh, which we hope and hoped, uh, or we won't. And so we, we did begin the design on the property, the smaller footprint property. Uh, I have to ask you, of course, about the news that also that broke over the weekend, and that was the Schooner Creek Farm lawsuit saying that mm -hmm. the city violated free speech, First Amendment rights, something that you've been talking about all along, um, which you explained many times to us, especially on the show. Uh, but the reason they say is that they, that they couldn't be restricted from the market was that there were the city enforced different rules. Did the city enforce different rules? No, Joe, I, you know, it's unfortunate. We do get sued. Of course, cities get sued all the time. Uh, I, I think this suit is meritless. Uh, we're confident that we've taken appropriate and legal steps all through the process uh, to honor the Constitution and the laws and to protect everybody's rights. And, um, you know, it can happen, we get sued when people disagree with that, but we're confident that the courts will agree with our approach. If they continue to pursue, it'll go to a court uh, trial and hearing. It, it could be settled, uh, it could be, um, uh, a court could dismiss it on summary judgment. So we'll, we'll protect the city's interest in this. You know, we've worked very hard through the farmer's market to protect the market, uh, protect the vendors, uh, those who make a living there, and also to protect the rights First Amendment uh, for, for everyone, for, for vendors and for patrons and visitors. Uh, and I think we've been very careful and explicit about that. Look, I've been very explicit too uh, that I think white supremacy is a terrible ideology and it's an abhorrent thing that when it arises as we've seen. Um, and uh, I can continue to say that. And I speak on behalf of the city and, and myself uh, that that ideology is, is, a, is a scourge. However, people have a right to believe what they want to believe in this country and will continue to protect their right to believe that. Teachers once again gathered at the State House following up on their Red for Ed rally in November. The Indiana Coalition for Public Education and a number of other groups demanded action from legislators. American Federation of Teachers Indiana President Gleneva Dunham says it's time for educators to use their political power. We have a union. We have students, we have parents, we have our faith-based supporters, we have administration, government officials. That is our community. They did applaud some of the legislative changes made this session, including a hold harmless measure signed by the governor last week and a push to decouple test scores from evaluations. The next superintendent of education will be the first one appointed to office by the governor and not an elected official. Bloomington Public Transit Corporation's Board of Directors plans to have proposed bus route changes ready by its next meeting in March. 
Transit Board and staff members spent the last four weeks internally reviewing the original proposals and came back with adjustments Tuesday. Late evening bus services still curtailed under the updated proposals, but the proposed micro transit system that would make up for the reduced service would be expanded from its original proposed area. It would serve a quarter mile quarter within the fixed routes that are ending at 930 within the city boundaries. If Bloomington Transit doesn't receive the $850,000 micro transit grant, May says three other funding mechanisms are possible. Transit could apply for another grant, use transit reserves, or possibly use funds from Mayor John Hamilton's proposed sustainability tax hike if enacted. In total, the proposed changes would add roughly 1,400 additional hours of service. Officials will spend the next month reviewing the proposals and plan to have final recommendations ready for their next meeting. That's Tuesday, March 17th. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. State legislators are considering a new bill that would help townships offer services to those experiencing homelessness. But some lawmakers fear it could drain money away from already cash-strapped communities. And as part of our Inquire Indiana series, we look at the contentious history and unique name of one small Indiana town. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. A bill in the Indiana State Senate is aiming to clarify who's responsible for assisting homeless people outside of high population areas. As George Hale reports, legislators hope to clarify when homeless people should be entitled to services if they can't prove residency. As a township trustee in southern Indiana's Bartholomew County, Ben Jackson has a lot of responsibilities. We have several functions. Um, one is we're responsible for fire protection. Also we're responsible for maintaining um, any abandoned cemeteries uh, in charge of eradicating four noxious weeds within the township. Another odd thing, township is called, uh, we're the official township fence viewer. One responsibility under Indiana law is administering township assistance. That could include helping people who are experiencing homelessness to still meet their basic needs. So, I mean, you need food, water, you need shelter. Um, and maybe clothing at certain times of the year in order to just survive. Um, a lot of the trustees don't get involved um, with homelessness because within homeless, uh, we're only charged with helping Columbus Township residents. But the paradox is people suffering from homelessness don't have a permanent residence. So it makes it a little amorphous as to who's supposed to help them or who's a who has the authority or who has the responsibility to assist them. Um, I take a more general view of residency. Um, uh, we try to help every homeless person that comes in here. The ones that are just um, passing through the area. The bill lawmakers are considering aims to clarify that township trustees should assist any homeless people in their jurisdiction, whether they can prove residency or not. Senate Bill 67 is trying to solve an issue of homelessness and try to support those that are in need. Uh, and, you know, trustees are kind of at the ground roots of all of this, and they really know their constituents, know folks in the community, and, you know, kind of a last-ditch safeguard for folks. Senator John Ford from Indianapolis is one of the bill's authors. There's been some question about can they use their funds to help people that don't live in their district, and I think this bill's really trying to uh, clarify that. The language of the bill is vague on what kinds of assistance trustees should be required to provide. 
It lets local officials decide what they can afford to do. For example, some like Jackson in Columbus could decide to provide overnight shelter at their partner facility. For others, it could be as simple as posting a sign outside the trustee's office suggesting charities to consult. Each township is unique and different, and so they can tailor it to what fits them the best. The bill incorporates changes proposed by State Senator Dennis Cruz. I would say most townships in Indiana have no homeless person, so I'm thinking this should not apply to small townships. So we I got with the author and he agreed and the committee agreed to have it be a population of 10,000 or more could do this homeless project. Cruz also feared that any requirement placed on townships would encourage homeless to travel to areas with the most social services and drain the resources there. It's a simple concept where you're when you're homeless your, your home is where you stand. Forrest Gilmore runs the Shalom Community Center in Bloomington a community that, relatively speaking, has a lot of resources to offer. Before, trustees had to um, uh, definitively prove, even people who are homeless, that someone who was seeking their services um, has a residence in their township. And when you're homeless, you don't have a residence, so, so trying to prove something you don't have becomes impossible. He says Cruz's prediction that people might migrate towards services is possible but he also thinks that's a natural reaction to difficult circumstances. Shalom, like other agencies, is there to help and wants to assist people who need it. It's possible that it could create some migration um, and some movement. But I think the biggest thing to remember is that when, when homeless people move, and they do, you know, some, some of them, a small percentage, um, do move from community to community, although most are, are, are local. Um, when that happens, they're fleeing something. They're not moving towards something. They're fleeing away from something. So if there's nothing for them where they are, if they don't have the basic necessities of life that they need, they're going to flee those to find a place that does. The bill has been referred to the House Committee on Government and Regulatory Reform. And last week, a state representative signed on as a co-sponsor. For Indiana News Desk, I'm George Hale. Well, and Indiana has its fair share of peculiar town names, many named after other places, Milan, Geneva, Brazil, and Peru, just to name a few. As part of our Inquire Indiana series, one curious person asked how Peru got its name and whether there were ever any Peruvians there. Tyler Lake traveled to Peru to find out. So did Peru get its name because of Peruvians living there? Well, the answer is no. But the town's name is a nod to the South American nation, and its history is rooted in a bitter conflict between two frontiersmen. So it was just a little spat, you know, between two gentlemen, a little business deal that went kind of south that um, um, created the town of Peru, and that's why we're called Peru and not Miami's port today. It all started with Joseph Holman, who bought the land from Miami Chief John B. Richardville around 1830. The, the first settlement here was called Miami's port. And it was expected to be um, a big deal in this part of Indiana, along the Wabash River. Not long after, Holman sold tracts of land to William Rayburn and William Hood, just outside of Miami's port. Joseph Holman decided to grow it and expand Miami's port to the west on William Rayburn's property. And this infuriated William Hood. So he immediately uh, contracted an engineer from the Wabash Erie Canal and platted a new town. And that came at a pivotal moment in the area's history. At the same time as this little feud was brewing, Miami County was being broke off from Cass County and this new county was going to be developed and Hood wanted Peru to be the county seat. And to secure that, he promised a public square he promised to build a brick courthouse, a log jail, and donate $125 for public records. Adkins says Hood was determined to make Peru the heart of the new county. He offered uh, free lots to any church that wanted to build in Peru. He offered lots on Broadway as cheap as $50 to any merchant in, in Miami's port that wanted to, to build in Peru. And it worked. A decade later, the town William Hood built from scratch was the seat of Miami County. But before all that, it needed a name, something Hood didn't seem too concerned about. 
when the engineers ask him, hey, what are you gonna call your new town? He said, I don't care, just as long as it has uh, a short name. And so a few names were just tossed around and the name Peru came up. Um, you know, several years earlier, Peru had gotten its independence from Spain. So the name Peru came up and he said, that's fine, let's go with it. And just like that, a new town was founded and the name of another far-flung locale found its way on to the Indiana map. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. Now, years later, Peru would be the home of elephants, tigers, clowns, and acrobats when several circuses wintered there, earning it the nickname Circus Capital of the World. They still host the annual Circus City Festival there every July. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.